everyone and welcome to today's edition of podcast today is tuesday june 27th 2023 i am rifat manan in california and i am remotely joined by my good friend emilio madrigal who is in boston today we are very delighted to have with us dr michael punsoni who is joining us from rhode island hospital at brown university so where he is the director of ophthalmic pathology and also director of autopsy services and he is an associate professor of pathology there so today he is going to uh, give a talk on ocular pathology and the title of his lecture is going to be approach to the anterior eye cornea and conjunctiva and uh, thank you for joining us today dr punsoni and we really appreciate uh, for your time and effort and to our viewers as always please feel free to post your questions and comments on the facebook and youtube chat windows and we will pass them over to dr punsoni at the end of the session so over to you now dr punsoni thank you thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak here today uh, the title of the talk as was mentioned is approach to the anterior eye and for today we'll be focusing on cornea and conjunctiva So we'll begin uh, with a brief anatomic review of the anterior compartment structures. We'll move on to a histologic evaluation of some of the most common disease processes that I see in my practice, uh, and then a discussion of corneal degenerations and some interesting dystrophies. I've uh, peppered the uh, teaching cases throughout the presentations, so I will complement some of the textbook cases with some of my own uh, teaching cases. And then at the end, I'll summarize some of the uh, take home points. So let's begin with our uh, anatomic review. Here we have a, a bivalved uh, globe, and we can see that the globe is divided into anterior and posterior chambers, collectively uh, the anterior segment, and posteriorly the much larger vitreous cavity, which comprises the posterior segment. If we look at the right hand image, we can see that. Uh, the anterior chamber is bordered anteriorly by the cornea and posteriorly by the anterior surface of the circular lens, uh, cir sorry, circular lens and the iris. The posterior chamber is bordered anteriorly by the iris pigmented epithelium, this dark pigmented epithelium here, laterally by the ciliary processes and ciliary epithelium, um, as well as uh, uh, posteriorly by the vitreous uh, uh, chamber. The anterior and posterior chambers are filled with aqueous humor, which is secreted by the ciliary epithelium on the ciliary processes. This fluid circulates and moves forward into the anterior chamber, ultimately draining through uh, the trabecular meshwork uh, in the uh, angles of the eye. Here we have uh, a histologic representation of a similar view in H E section showing the a large posterior vitreous. Uh, chamber in the back, the anterior and posterior chambers uh, in the front. The uh, aqueous fluid, as we mentioned, from the posterior chamber will uh, drain into the anterior chamber out through the trabecular meshwork. And here we see anteriorly uh, the cornea. The cornea forms uh, the anterior portion of the outer structure of the eye and has two main functions. First, to protect the inner contents of the eye and second to provide about two thirds of the eye's refractive uh, power. Here at the superficial layer, this is the outside world. We're moving into the superficial layer of the cornea. This is the epithelium, it's a squamous epithelial layer, uh, which sits on an epithelial basement membrane. This is a PAS positive basement membrane. And then we have uh, Bowman's membrane or Bowman's layer, which is a fibrous meshwork. Uh, then we have the bulk of the cornea, which is made up of a stroma. It's about 90% uh, 90 of the corneal thickness, um, uh, dense connective tissue. And then decimates membrane, as we move inwards uh, into the cornea, we have decimates membrane, which sits on uh, the single layer of endothelial cells that lines the posterior cornea. The epithelium and endothelium both play important roles in maintaining corneal transparency. Uh, first, the normal cornea is a vascular, no blood vessels, and it lacks uh, any lymphatic drainage. Uh, but it is well innervated with axons uh, that originate from the trigeminal nerve and penetrate throughout the corneal stroma. As the cornea uh, has no blood supply of its own, um, it gets oxygen uh, only from tears and directly from the surrounding air. 
Uh, secondly, the cornea acts as a mechanical barrier uh, to fluid diffusion and creates a gradient that allows osmotic transport of water out of the stroma. So you have uh, here in the posterior border of the cornea, we have that aqueous humor, which has fluid, uh, which can enter the cornea uh, via this uh, endothelial ion pump, um, and uh, uh, the fluid is uh, osmotically moved out of the cornea to keep it in a semi-dehydrated state to allow for a uh, visual acuity. At a high power view, we can uh, appreciate the epithelium, again, a non-keratinizing squamous epithelium, approximately five cell layers thick. Um, importantly, uh, the basal layer uh, is composed of larger basal cells, and we see maturation with flattening of the epithelial cells uh, towards the superficial surface. We appreciate that very thin epithelial basement membrane, uh, which is an important physiologic barrier between the epithelium and stroma. Again, it's a PS positive membrane, which can be very helpful. Uh, to illustrate some uh, pathologic processes. Um, and then we have Bowman's membrane or Bowman's layer, um, uh, uh, which is a thick acellular, uh, acellular non-regenerating collagenous layer. Uh, since uh, uh, Bowman's layer cannot regenerate, if it does become injured, it can be replaced by um, epithelial tissue or stromal scar tissue, and we'll review some of those uh, conditions shortly. Moving down into the corneal stroma, uh, primarily type one collagen, that's a posse cellular uh, area, uh, mainly composed of collagen lamellae um, and stromal uh, keratocytes. These keratocytes are specialized fibroblasts uh, that secrete the lamellae. And one of the first areas that I inspect uh, when I receive a corneal specimen is the stroma. Um, and I specifically uh, try to appreciate uh, whether there's presence or absence of these uh, clefts or spaces within the stroma present between the corneal lamellae. Uh, these spaces are artifacts of processing, specifically uh, due to dehydration steps in the lab. And the absence of these clefts uh, is an indication of pathology with stromal thickening often secondary to edema and thinning due to fibrosis. If we move down posteriorly through the cornea now into Desmet's membrane, this is uh, a thick uh, basement membrane. Again, this is a PAS positive membrane uh, secreted by the corneal endothelium. The endothelium, the outermost or innermost area of the cornea, posterior cornea, um, is a single layer of cuboidal cells. And it's these cells, kind of the workhorses of the cornea um, that uh, maintain the fluid ion balance of the cornea, keeps the cornea in that semi-dehydrated state. Uh, endothelial cell dysfunction uh, tends to increase progressively uh, with age as well as with uh, disease. And the result of insufficiency of these endothelial cells or loss um, is corneal edema. As I mentioned, Desmet's membrane is a PES positive membrane. Um, I keep a uh, standing order in, in, in our lab here that all, all corneal specimens should routinely come with a PAS stain. It's a very cheap and easy stain that most labs can do. And this can be very uh, helpful and illustrative in uh, several disease states. Now there are of course a, a multitude of corneal diseases that we could discuss today, um, but I wanna focus our uh, discussion on um, uh, the most common diseases uh, present in the US as well as uh, what I see in my practice here. So looking at a large ret retrospective review, um, we can stratify the incidence of uh, some of these major uh, corneal uh, diseases and we'll cover many of these today, including uh, inflammatory diseases like keratitis and ulceration, perforation, uh, dystrophies and degeneration. We'll touch on most of these today. Uh, corneal grafts and infectious diseases uh, due to microorganisms. So the cornea primarily uh, acts as a barrier as well as allowing for um, visual acuity. Uh, the anterior surface of the cornea is an interface between the eye and the external environment, as I mentioned. Uh, several important protective mechanisms, including the corneal endothelium. Uh, there's mucus secreted by the uh, conjunctival goblet cells that we'll touch on later. Those can trap microorganisms, as well as tear production that can wash away those uh, organisms. Uh, infection uh, can develop when that barrier is compromised. We see this in several important uh, uh, conditions. Um, I always mention uh, with uh, July 4th coming up, this is uh, a time when we tend to see a lot more nucleations, unfortunately, with um, uh, fireworks, um, foreign body perforation. You can see this with woodworking, metalworking, uh, shards of glass, uh, epithelial abrasion uh, can be common in contact lens wearers, um, chronic states like bullous keratopathy, as well as uh, microorganism invasion, which can be a direct uh, via uh, perforation. <clears throat> 
Uh, mo the most common uh, bacterial agents of infection uh, include staph, uh, strep, and pseudomonas. And typically, it's the most uh, clinically worrisome severe infections that will lead to uh, corneal necrosis, perforation, and scarring. As I mentioned, uh, contact lens wearers have an increased incidence of uh, infections, particularly by organisms such as acanthamoeba, uh, which uh, we'll sh I'll, I'll show a little bit later. Um, these patients are at increased risk of abrasions and other uh, corneal trauma. So this is an example of a case I had, a 26-year-old male with a history of ocular trauma, um, which uh, can be, as I mentioned, a major cause of ocular morbidity. Severe blunt or sharp trauma can lead to uh, corneal perforation, as is seen in this case. And the visual outcome tends to depend on severity and location of uh, any resultant corneal scarring and injury to associated ocular structures. In this example, we see a cornea with uh, significant uh, acanthosis or thickening uh, of the epithelial layers. Uh, keep in mind that normal resting state of the cornea at five cell layers thick, we can see uh, many more layers here uh, as a result of this uh, reaction to an injury. Uh, there's also focal loss or diminution of the, of the epithelium as you move uh, toward the left of the slide uh, to complete ulceration and ultimately perforation. We also see the stroma. Again, remember to those normal examples, the stroma tends to be in its normal state, posse-cellular and avascular, and we see that there's a large cellular infiltrate as well as a blood vessel formation. And we can ap better appreciate that neovascularization in the stroma um, as well as this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and some reactive uh, fibroblastic change as well. Uh, corneal uh, keratitis, a very common condition, again, primarily uh, occurs when there's a breakdown in the defense uh, of the cornea. And this can be a major uh, vision threatening condition, uh, tends to require prompt diagnosis and treatment uh, to ultimately prevent visual morbidity. Uh, untreated microbial keratitis can result in corneal perforation, as we've seen, with the potential for a progressive uh, disease such as endophthalmitis and further uh, vision loss. Uh, corneal opacities due to microbial keratitis are the fourth leading cause of blindness worldwide. And in many cases, uh, keratitis is due to uh, the breakdown of, uh, of the corneal defenses I've mentioned, whereby organisms gain direct access to the stroma. Uh, there are a variety of organisms to consider, uh, the usual suspects, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. And typically, um, if I have uh, a pertinent clinical history uh, that is uh, suspicious for keratitis, I'll uh, check right away, see if cultures have been ordered. Um, I'll order um, some routine stains to um, uh, try to speciate or um, uh, identify the organisms um, that are the culprit in these cases. In the top right-hand corner, we see um, the clinical presentation of some of these uh, patients with this uh, whitish exudate in the eye. This is hypopian, which uh, microscopically is manifest as uh, a sea of neutrophils, abscess formation in the anterior chamber. For or orientation, again, here's the cornea, posterior cornea, decimates membrane, uh, and here in the posterior uh, segment, uh, sorry, in the uh, anterior chamber, the posterior portion of the cornea is this uh, in, uh, neutrophilic inflammation, which clinically is hypopian. Uh, this is an example uh, of a 46-year-old male contact lens wearer who had an acute presentation of irritation and uh, altered vision. Uh, bacterial keratitis uh, may be acute or chronic. It's usually a transient infection, can be slowly progressive or rapidly deteriorating, tends to be a separative type of process, and it can involve any part of the cornea. Um, uh, the incidence varies considerably between um, uh, Western and developing countries, um, as well as understanding which causative organisms are going to be most common. Histopathological ulceration, and again, acutely inflamed cornea, as well as um, in the epithelium, as well as in the stroma. High-powered view, uh, this was actually an enucleation specimen, so you can see some of these uh, posterior structures like iris. Um, but within the um, uh, cornea, again, this prominent uh, inflammation, and in the anterior chamber, you see this uh, abscess formation, which is compatible clinically with hypopian. A gram stain uh, revealed uh, numerous uh, uh, gram-positive cocci, and a culture uh, revealed the causative agent in this case. Uh, the variability of uh, a stromal infiltration is quite high. In this case, this is a diffuse stromal cell inflammatory infiltrates uh, with neovascularization, uh, fibrosis, as well as compensatory 
um, uh, epithelial hyperplasia. Uh, the variability in terms of ulceration is quite high as well. Here we see stroma uh, that again has this diminution and ulceration progressively until only Desmond's membrane uh, is left. This is a very serious outcome of progressive corneal ulceration uh, known as desmetacil, uh, which can result from traumatic, infectious, or inflammatory uh, etiologies. Uh, fungal keratitis is another common cause of microbial keratitis. Um, again, the etiologic agent is going to vary according to the geographic region. Um, uh, filamentous fungi are responsible, are responsible for about 70% of cases, with aspergillus and fusarium being more common in tropical regions, whereas candida is more prevalent in more temperate regions. Uh, it's important to have a familiarity with uh, predisposing risk factors, as well as the clinical features uh, to make early diagnosis. Uh, most common risk factor associated with mycotic keratitis is ocular trauma, but there are several other important risk factors, uh, such as contact lens uh, use, ocular surgeries, uh, use of uh, steroids, immunocompromised states such as HIV, malignancy, and uh, diabetes. Uh, this particular case was a 63-year-old male uh, who uh, presented with severe eye pain, and you can see in the histologic images, Again, this is a, it was an enucleation specimen, so we're seeing some additional structures here in addition to the cornea. Uh, but within a higher power view of the corneal stroma, we can see this uh, prominent neutrophilic infiltrate, uh, some foreign material, which likely represents suture, multinucleated giant cells. And uh, a GMS stain uh, that I performed showed uh, numerous uh, hyphae as well as yeast forms compatible with uh, diagnosis of candida. I'm moving on to um, some viral agents. Uh, herpes simplex is a relatively common infection that's often asymptomatic. It's the number one cause of uh, corneal and infectious blindness, and one of the most common indications for corneal transplantation. Uh, globally, the annual incidence of HSV keratitis is uh, 1.5 million, with about 40,000 new cases each year in the US. Uh, classically, the lesion involves the corneal epithelium, but ulceration might involve all layers of the cornea. Uh, viral cultures tend to be positive in about three quarters of cases. And while it's often a self-limited infection, uh, recurrent disease is relatively common. We see it about one, in about one quarter of cases and maybe due to active viral infection or reactivation as the virus can remain latent in the trigeminal ganglion. Uh, importantly, the most significant risk factor for HSV keratitis is a past history of ocular keratitis, uh, HSV keratitis. So again, clinical history is very, very uh, important. Uh, compensatory hyper, uh, epithelial hyperplasia is common in these cases, though it's relatively nonspecific. Uh, the epithelium can become markedly thickened, usually over areas where you see uh, stromal loss, where there tends to be fibrosis and loss of those artifactual clefts that, that we touched on earlier, uh, but Bowman's layer can be uh, preserved. With uh, chronic herpetic uh, stromal keratitis, the stroma tends to become, uh, again, markedly thinned and scarred. Uh, there can be chronic inflammation, usually Bowman's layer is lost, and a decimus uh, membrane uh, becomes highly ectatic. If you examine the posterior corneal stroma and find uh, uh, granulomatous changes, um, as well as histiocyte inflammation, um, you should have a pretty low threshold for consideration of herpes. This is not the only condition that can do it, but um, you should uh, really check the clinical history and speak to your colleagues uh, about the potential for herpes uh, infection. Uh, Ecanth amoeba keratitis, uh, as I've mentioned, is closely uh, linked to the use of soft contact lenses, particularly those who uh, use contaminated lens solution or swim in a pool with contaminated water while wear wearing contacts, often presents as a uh, painful keratitis. And, and though it's known to respond to medical treatment, uh, depending on the severity of the infection, uh, corneal transplantation may be needed. Uh, the inflammation uh, can be highly variable. Um, and organisms, while they can be seen on routine H&E, uh, they can be quite difficult to find. In my experience, um, and I've seen a few of these, having a strong clinical suspicion of, of acanth amoeba keratitis in the contact lens where it prompts me to stop and screen for these uh, very small organisms. Uh, they tend to look like um, enlarged uh, cells with uh, foamy to clear cytoplasm, and the nuclei uh, typically have very prominent nucleoli, which can uh, help make them stand out a little bit from the background. Uh, I often find PS to be helpful as well, though uh, they can be seen on routine h &E. uh, In starting to uh, develop an approach 
um, to ocular pathology. Uh, I feel it's very important to have, in addition to a knowledge of a basic an ocular anatomy, at least a working understanding of the various uh, surgical approaches taken by our ophthalmology com, uh, colleagues. In other words, uh, what are the potential ocular specimens that you may receive and, and for what indication? Uh, corneal grafting is a good example of when this knowledge comes into play. Um, in cases where uh, the entire cornea is transplanted in a procedure known as uh, penetrating keratoplasty, we receive full thickness corneal specimens. However, you may also receive a partial thickness transplant that includes a subset of these corneal layers, such as posterior corneal stromal specimens or solely uh, endothelial layer specimens. Any corneal disorder that causes significant visual impairment uh, may ultimately be an indication for corneal grafting. Uh, that's really a clinical uh, decision. However, the prognosis does vary greatly. Uh, the risk of rejection is higher in certain uh, settings. For example, if the cornea is heavily vascularized, if it's uh, markedly inflamed or perforated, which we've uh, seen in a few of our examples of severe keratitis. Uh, in uncomplicated or low-risk primary grafts, but the survival rate with local immunosuppression has uh, been reported to be quite high, almost 95% at five years due to what's known as the immune privileged status of the cornea. This is caused by several factors, two of which I mentioned earlier, including a lack of corneal vascularity. Uh, therefore, there's no delivery of any immune agents to the cornea and an absence of corneal lymphatics, so no drainage out of the area. Uh, I should probably clarify the term graft rejection refers to specific immunologic response of the host to donor uh, corneal tissue. And that's different from non-immune mediated graft failures, such as a primary donor failure. Primary donor graft failures are uh, usually uh, due to corneal edema, which is secondary to inherent deficiencies in corneal graft, uh, surgical trauma, or potentially improperly a stored tissue. Th this gets to be a fairly large topic. For the, so for the purposes of today's talk, we'll focus uh, primarily on the main histologic and diagnostic features of graft failure, including corneal edema, which is something we've uh, already touched on. It's important to keep in mind that corneal edema is, is very commonly identified in graft failure and is most often caused by endothelial damage or disease. Uh, prior intraocular surgery, including removal of a lens, uh, intraocular lens placement, or loss of a previous graft are often indications for leading to graft failure. Uh, there are several primary endothelial diseases, uh, such as Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, which we'll discuss a little bit later, uh, but there are others, as, uh, including congenital hereditary endothelia, and posterior polymorphous dystrophy. And one of the primary features of grass failure is uh, corneal edema. And this is exemplified best by uh, a bullous keratopathy, where we see, uh, if we look at the posterior cornea and look at Desmet's membrane, we see marked loss of endothelial cells. We'll see decreased uh, areas of stromal clefting, separation of the uh, corneal epithelium from Bowman's membrane, which leads to the formation of bullae. Uh, when the fluid from that aqueous humor uh, no longer can be transported, pumped out by those uh, endothelial cells, you get resultant corneal edema in the stroma. As the fluid progresses and moves anteriorly or superficially, uh, it can move into the epithelium, which results in what's known as hydropic epithelial change. Um, these basal corneal epithelial cells uh, can become quite distended in those cases. A Desmet's membrane uh, in graft failure tends to be uh, pretty regular in contour. It's not thickened, as we do see uh, in some primary endothelial diseases, and there is a marked loss of endothelial cells, and you can contrast that with a normal uh, uh, example of a cornea, and here you see those endothelial cells in the normal state and marked loss in uh, uh, examples of graft failure. Some of these features, uh, such as stromal edema, loss of clefting, loss of endothelial cells may, may seem subtle, and it's true they can be difficult to recognize on all biopsies, depending on the procedure performed and the inherent disease in the cornea. But generally, what I find is putting together the relevant history, as well as some simple stains like PAS, can improve the changes that we make uh, in accurate diagnosis, as in cases of uh, graft failure. Uh, this is an, uh, uh, an example uh, that I thought uh, well demonstrated this point about bullous keratopathy. This is an 80-year-old male uh, who presented with a blind and painful right eye. Uh, the cornea showed uh, these very nice uh, uh, bullae, bullous formation, uh, hydropic epithelial changes, uh, stromal edema, and really marked loss of those artifactual clefts we've talked about, as well as mild endothelial uh, cell dropout. 
Another important pathologic finding that can be present in several corneal diseases, including infectious uh, keratitis, graft failure, some corneal dystrophies, and conditions that lead to chronic epithelial edema, including glaucoma, is formation of uh, corneal panis. A corneal panis is uh, defined as being a flat superficial scar in the anterior cornea. There are two main types, inflammatory panis and degenerative panis. Uh, both of these are a layer of connective tissue that's interposed between the epithelium and an intact Bowman's membrane. On the left-hand side, we see an example of a degenerative panis. This is usually a result of chronic edema with pulmonary keratopathy. It does not uh, necessarily grow in from the limbus. Uh, stromal fibroblasts migrate into the space in between the detached epithelium and Bowman's membrane and secrete uh, and synthesize collagen. Uh, in way, uh, by way of contrast, on the right-hand side, we see the inflammatory panis, which is uh, sub-epithelial uh, ingrowth of inflamed fibrovascular tissue from the limbus, which uh, typically will destroy Bowman's membrane. Classically, this is described in syphilitic uh, trachoma, but we, we also see it uh, more commonly these days in many of the conditions I've described so far. So let's move on to uh, our next topic, which is uh, corneal dystrophies and degenerations. Uh, we can start that discussion with a calcific band keratopathy, which is a relatively common form of corneal degeneration uh, defined by a subepithelial uh, deposition of calcium. Typically begins just inside the limbus. Uh, this area, uh, if we look on the right-hand side image uh, in the three and nine o'clock periphery, spreads centrally in a band-like distribution. Uh, eventually, uh, as the disease progresses, uh, leads to a significant visual impairment. Um, initially, the calcium uh, deposits are confined to the epithelial basement membrane, an anterior surface of Bowman's layer, but with disease progression, uh, the, depo uh, the deposits may extend anteriorly and ultimately break through uh, the epithelial surface. Uh, there are several important causes, not the least of which is idiopathic, um, but you can see also a chronic ocular disease cases like uveitis, uh, having calcific band keratopathy, uh, settings of a chemical exposure like secondary to mercury, uh, hypercalcemic states, uh, some hereditary disorders, as well as some systemic diseases. Another important uh, um, degenerative disorder um, to discuss is keratoconus. Um, onset is typically in the teenage years. Incidence is, again, relatively common, about one in uh, 2,000. Uh, most cases are sporadic in nature, but less commonly, about 10% of time, you can see some familial cases as well. Uh, it's characterized by progressive corneal thinning and ectasia that you can see here in the cornea, very ectatic usually. Um, clinically uh, described as having the eyes won't take on a conical shape instead of a spherical shape, which results clinically in irregular astigmatism. Unlike many of the other corneal degener degenerations, it's typically bilateral. And thinning of the cornea with breaks in Bowman's layer are uh, histologic hallmarks. In some patients, uh, Desmet's membrane may rupture, which allows that aqueous humor uh, in that uh, space just posterior to the cornea uh, to enter the anterior chamber, uh, gain access to the stroma, and lead to a condition known as corneal hydrops, which can uh, suddenly worsen, uh, worsen the patient's vision. As I mentioned, uh, one of the histologic hallmarks of keratoconus are dehiscences or breaks in Bowman's membrane. Uh, there's often focal thickening or irregularity overlying these areas in the epithelium to, to help you find them. Uh, some examples, as in the, the example on the left, you can very clearly find, identify these breaks, uh, but some, uh, as in the example on the right-hand side, can be quite uh, subtle and require some high-powered uh, review to find the um, uh, affected areas. Uh, Fleischer ring is described clinically in keratoconus and is the result of uh, iron deposition in the corneal epithelium. And I'll typically get a Prussian uh, blue stain for iron um, if, I, if I have a history of keratoconus or if I'm suspecting keratoconus based on the uh, initial review of the corneal specimen. Uh, this is a, a very interesting example I had. A 52-year-old male came in with uh, quote-unquote poor vision. Uh, the specimen showed this very classic uh, uh, corneal ectasia with central thinning. Uh, the epithelium uh, showed areas of hyperplasia and hypoplasia with multiple dehiscences or breaks in Bowman's membrane. Uh, there was stromal edema, fibrosis, and focal bullous changes as well. Prussian blue iron stain did show uh, focal epithelial positivity, though I didn't take a picture of it for this one, uh, because additionally, there were these uh, um, kind of uh, pink amorphous stromal deposits as well. 
I did a PS stain and the deposits were positive for PS. Uh, I did a Congo red and these um, uh, deposits were positive as well. They were negative for trichrome, alcyon blue and colloidal iron. So this was uh, very supportive of amyloid de deposition. Uh, this turned out to be an interesting case of keratoconus uh, and, uh, with uh, stromal amyloid uh, deposition, which can be seen in uh, several dystrophies. Uh, amyloid can be, of course, classified as primary or secondary, as well as localized or systemic. This patient didn't have a prior diagnosis of uh, um, amyloid, uh, and this individual is uh, pending some additional uh, clinical workup. So that leads directly into our uh, next discussion, which is corneal dystrophies. Uh, they're a very heterogeneous group of dis, uh, disorders, uh, but we'll start with the features that they share and then move on to the histopathologic features that separate them and allow us to make uh, pathologic diagnoses. Um, they all uh, involve accumulation of abnormal material, which leads to a range of clinical presentations, usually involving uh, altered vision. Uh, often they have a bilateral presentation and may progress uh, relatively slowly. Most commonly, they're autosomal dominant, but there are a few um, exceptions. The classification system uh, used for corneal dystrophy has gone through several iterations. Uh, in 2008, the uh, IC3D, or International Committee for Classification of Corneal Dystrophies, uh, aimed to develop a classification scheme through integration of phenotype, pathology, and genetics. Uh, this method contained uh, traditional anatomic classification uh, based on organizing dystrophies according to corneal layer that was primarily affected. However, the major limitation was that the dystrophies were solely assigned to one single layer that was most affected. So in 2015, the classification scheme was updated uh, to better clarify the variety of disease processes, as, as I've shown here. And um, it, it's quite an extensive uh, classification scheme, so we will focus our dis uh, discussion on a few of the most well-studied corneal dystrophies, uh, which are the epithelial stromal dystrophies caused by uh, autosomal dominant missense mutations in the transforming growth factor beta-induced chain. Um, this is a gene that's located on chromosome 5Q and provides instructions for making keratoepithelium, uh, which is an extracellular matrix protein thought to play a role in cell adhesion and migration. I will also cover uh, one other very important and common endothelial dystrophy, which is Fuchs corneal dystrophy. So we'll begin with uh, lattice corneal dystrophy, the most common of all corneal epithelial stromal dystrophies, typically autosomal dominant and bilateral with presentation towards the end of the first decade of life. Uh, it's characterized clinically by so-called lattice lines. And histopathologically, we see irregular linear subepithelial and stromal amyloid deposits uh, with normal uh, decimates membrane and endothelium. It has a un unique arginine to cysteine mutation at position 124 in the TGF uh, BI gene. An uh, H&E stain of the cornea uh, in one of these cases uh, typically will show, uh, if not at low power, at high power, these pink amorphous deposits present in the stroma. Uh, which show apple green birefringence, and when uh, performed with uh, thioflavin T immunofluorescence, which is what I typically use, uh, they light up uh, very nicely. Uh, in granular dystrophy uh, type two, uh, uh, sorry, type one, this typically pre presents early in the first decade of life uh, with characteristically described crumb like opacities in the anterior to mid stroma, extending into the posterior stroma in uh, advanced disease. Uh, the disease is typically asymptomatic early on, but with time, the opacities can coalesce and lead to uh, decreased vision. Uh, recurrent corneal erosions can occur here, uh, but often at a lower incidence than in lattice dystrophy, and it does have a unique arginine to tryptophan uh, mutation. Uh, histopathologically, we see regular granular deposits of the mutant uh, protein on H&E stain within the stroma. Uh, which uh, have been described as looking like rock candy during, uh, due to the very angulated uh, irregular margins. A uh, trichrome stain highlights uh, these uh, deposits uh, brightly red, and there's no evidence of amyloid de deposition by Congo red. A granular dystrophy type 2, which is also known as avelino or combined granular lattice corneal dystrophy, uh, typically presents in the second decade of life. Um, it has an arginine to histidine mutation. Uh, interestingly, the disease was thought to have originated from uh, one specific family in Avellino, Italy, which is where the name comes from. Uh, but uh, now uh, we know that uh, many of these cases have been more recently reported in patients uh, from uh, several other countries, the highest prevalence uh, being in East Asia. Histopathologically, uh, the cornea has uh, stromal deposits, uh, which highlight 
or which are uh, highlighted by Massan's trichrome, indicating the presence of highland material. In addition, in addition on uh, Congo red staining, uh, they demonstrate these amorphous eosinophilic deposits, uh, which show uh, apple green birefringence on polarization, indicating the presence of an white. Uh, this was an example I have uh, of a 33-year-old female uh, with progressive visual impairments in childhood. Uh, again, I saw that regular amorphous deposits on H&E, uh, which by trichrome stained uh, brightly red. I did a Congo red stain, uh, which uh, revealed the, the deposits to be uh, positive and were um, birefringent on uh, polarization. And after a trichrome, uh, sorry, a thioflavin T, again, email fluorescence, again, stained uh, very brightly, indicating the presence of the M1. I put together this table. I find it to be useful um, to organize um, these cases uh, in terms of their clinical features, mutation, and histology. As I mentioned, there are several areas of overlap, but this kind of helps me uh, organize uh, my approach in uh, making these diagnoses. Uh, we'll move on to the one, the one endothelial dystrophy we'll talk about, Fuchs corneal dystrophy, uh, characterized by uh, abnormalities of the corneal endothelium and decimates membrane. Uh, the clinical symptoms are due to uh, uh, derangement of the fluid transport system uh, by the corneal endothelium, which leads to edema in the corneal stroma and reduced clarity of the cornea uh, and, and, and impairs visual acuity. Uh, Fuchs is overall very common. Uh, I get these specimens uh, quite often. It's one of the most prevalent corneal dystrophies in the, in the U.S., uh, where it affects about 4% of the population over the age of 40 and is a very common indication for corneal transplants. Uh, Fuchs tends to be a bilateral, slowly progressive corneal disorder of aging, generally, generally presents clinically during the fifth or sixth uh, decade of life. Uh, here, Desmond's membrane becomes thickened, with accumulation of numerous uh, flat anvil-shaped excrescences known as gutte, and uh, corneal endothelial cells can become reduced in number, which leads to, again, progressive stromal edema and, and worsening blurry vision. Eventually, the fluid can move into the epithelium and uh, result in worse visual impairment, including formation of bullet. Uh, by contrast, gutte tend to be more confluent and more centrally located than what we see in gutte of aging, which character characteristically involves the peripheral uh, cornea. Uh, there are many examples I could have shown. Uh, as I said, this is a quite, uh, quite a common specimen that re we received. This is a, a one I chose, a 72-year-old female, which was a, a good example of a uh, decimate uh, specimen from an uh, automated stripping ophthalmology. Optimal ophthalmologic procedure where we typically receive fragments of membranous tissue. Um, this uh, patient, again, presented with poor vision. Um, and the H&E stain showed several of these anvil-shaped excrescences, um, which are uh, the gutte. Um, also showed thickening of decimates membrane. And if you look uh, closely, there are also some of what are known as buried gutte as well, which uh, can be brought out by a PAS stain, again, which highlights the gutte as well as this corneal thickening. Uh, sorry, endo, uh, um, decimates thickly. So let's move on now to uh, the conjunctiva, a brief uh, anatomic review. Uh, the conjunctiva is continuous with the eyelid laterally and with the cornea uh, medially. It's a thin mucous membrane uh, with a protective function and allows the eyelids to move uh, smoothly over the globe. Uh, it has uh, rich uh, lymphatic channels connecting to the parotid and submandibular nodes and is composed of a stratified columnar epithelium uh, with numerous goblet cells, which helps uh, me to identify it when, when it's a challenging case. It also has an underlying uh, loose connective tissue lamina propria. Uh, there are several um, associated lacrimal glands that produce most of the aqueous tear film layer that coats and protects the surface of the eye. Uh, if there's dysfunction of this uh, layer, uh, that often leads to a variety of surface pathology, including ulceration that we've already seen. So again, one of the most common specimens I receive, pterygia. Uh, a pterygium is a benign degenerative disease, most often characterized as wedge-shaped ingrowth of conjunctival tissue um, that can slowly uh, invade into the peripheral cornea. Uh, the nasal limbus um, is most uh, typically affected, um, and both eyes uh, are often involved. Uh, interestingly, the name uh, pterygium refers to its resemblance to a wing, uh, specifically a bat or an insect wing, uh, and that's kind of what it looks like clinically as well, this wing-shaped um, um, process that extends from the conjunctiva onto uh, the cornea. Uh, 
Uh, pterygium is closely related to a pinguecula, uh, but they do have some important differences. Uh, both appear as submucosal elevations on the conjunctiva. Uh, both are related to uh, excess sun exposure, actinic damage, and both are located in the interpalpebral fissure or sun exposed area of the eye. Uh, they differ in the fact that um, pterygia involve the cornea and conjunctiva, and pinguecula are limited uh, to the conjunctiva. Although most uh, pterygia are entirely benign, it's often worthwhile to submit the tissue uh, for pathologic examination. Um, I've spoken to uh, surgeons before about the importance of submitting uh, these cases because uh, while it is rare, uh, precursors of other actinic-induced neoplasms uh, that can be more worrisome, like squamous cell carcinomas, melanomas, can uh, very rarely uh, be detected in these lesions. Uh, pterygia arise from uh, the limbal epithelium within the conjunctiva, where uh, stem cells are thought to arise, uh, to reside. It's thought that uh, chronic excessive UV exposure activates or mutates those limbal stem cells, which leads to local damage and uh, possible cell proliferation. Histologically, pterygia often contain uh, conjunctival tissue with a small portion of uh, corneal epithelium. Uh, Bowman's membrane is typically uh, absent, and you can see uh, all those goblet cells in that conjunctival epithelium. Uh, and the stroma tends to show a solar elastosis, which uh, can be highlighted by an elastin stain, along with vascular congestion and mild chronic inflammation. Uh, in 2011, uh, over a decade ago now, uh, uh, Nick D. Uh, Girolamo's group in Sydney, Australia, did some uh, really great work on reviewing the classic diagnostic features of pterygium, as well as the role of cumulative uh, UV radiation exposure and pterygium development, which essentially results in focal limbal dam damage that triggers migration of altered limbal stem cells towards the center, a uh, central cornea. Uh, they also uh, illustrated a very compelling model of how ocular surface squamous neoplasia and melanoma might arise from pterygia based on peripheral light focusing um, at the nasal limbus, which potentially may activate or mutate uh, limbal stem cells, resulting in clonal expansion, local cell proliferation, and invasion into the cornea. Uh, just about 10 years later, uh, in 2021, uh, Karina Koppen's group in Belgium examined the pathophysiologic underpinnings of benign, uh, benign pterygium pathology and how that may overlap with mechanisms related to ocular surface squamous neoplasia and skin cancer. Uh, this schematic diagram here illustrates the pathway and similarities between pterygium, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and epithelial cancers, starting from the initial uh, insult of uh, UV radiation and the damage shared between the UV-related lesions and their uniform uh, cell reactions. Uh, the difference between pterygium and UV-related malignant cancer is uh, believed to lie within this uh, very important final step of transformation of through dysplasia. Uh, we'll move on to another important topic, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. Uh, this is a category that includes conjunctival dysplasia, commonly referred to as conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia, or CIN, as well as conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, squamous cell lesions of the conjunctiva tend to occur secondary to excessive sun exposure in the conjunctiva, again, near the limbus, uh, the region, that region where stem cells are known to reside. Uh, the clinical image um, at the top uh, shows this area of thickened uh, uh, conjunctiva with a gelatinous appearance and has these uh, prominent feeder vessels to the lesion. Uh, in the microscopic image um, to the left, uh, we see CIN with uh, a moderate dysplasia, including poor cellular maturation, a disordered arrangement of cells, as well as several uh, mitotic figures. Uh, importantly, there's still a, a, an amount of uh, service differentiation and maturation. In the example on the right, uh, we see full thickness replacement of the normal epithelial layer where the epithelium has been totally replaced by atypical squamous cells consistent with a diagnosis of carcinoma in situ, uh, as well as a, a sharp transition compared to the segment of normal limbal epithelium on the right uh, indicated by the arrow. And importantly here, the epithelial basement membrane is intact. Uh, here's uh, a case I had, 37-year-old male with uh, conjunctival biopsy that showed uh, this uh, focal area of uh, thickened epithelium with a cellular disorganization. And if we look at an inset at higher power, 
can see uh, there was a moderate increased uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, prominent nucleoli, as well as several uh, mitotic figures. Uh, the histologic features of dysplasia in this case uh, included uh, disorganization, lack of maturation, and increased mitotic activity, again, uh, I've designated at the arrows, and it involved approximately two-thirds of the conjunctival thickness, approaching full thickness dysplasia, and consistent with uh, um, CIN 2 to 3, moderate to severe intraepithelial neoplasia in this case. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva, uh, has multifactorial etiology, uh, similar to uh, um, these cases elsewhere in the body, including environmental factors such as increased risk with increased sun exposure, uh, more commonly occurring in fair-skinned individuals. Uh, several uh, studies have uh, postulated a potential role regarding HPV infection. Uh, appears to be some relationship uh, of HPV 16 and 18 with malignant disease and uh, strain 6, 8, and 11 with benign disease, such as we see in conjunctival papillomas. In uh, areas with high uh, HIV uh, infection rates, there also appears to be a relationship with increased risk for ocular surface squamous neoplasia. Uh, in the first, uh, the top image, uh, we, see, we see a limbal tumor uh, that, that appears whitish or leukoplakic, uh, indicating keratin production. Uh, there's peripheral corneal invasion, as well as prominent feeder uh, vessels. Uh, the image uh, just below shows a transition from uh, benign epithelium uh, to uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma on the right. Uh, conjunctival squamous cell carcinomas do have a potential for metastatic spread, usually to regional lymph nodes. Um, unfortunately, the frequency of metastasis is quite low, and most cases are treated locally uh, by wide excision. Uh, this was an interesting case. I had a 50-year-old uh, 50 male with a history of uh, right eye conjunctival limb lesion that uh, had grown, according to the history, had grown uh, significantly over the past one to two months. Um, so right away, I knew this is a rapid growth, likely indicative of something aggressive. Uh, histologically, uh, I noticed right away a very thickened uh, conjunctiva uh, with marked cellular atypia, um, overlying uh, keratin production, correlating with that leukoplakia seen, seen clinically, uh, and no visible um, uh, intact basement membrane as well as a desmoplastic change uh, indicating uh, the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, in this case, uh, one lateral margin on the left-hand side image, this lateral margin shows this nice, very sharp transition uh, to uh, benign epithelium. So this margin was negative. Unfortunately, on the opposite side, um, the margin was uh, uh, positive. Uh, moving on to our, our last topic, um, melanocytic lesions of the conjunctiva, starting with uh, primary acquired melanosis, or PAM, also known as uh, conjunctival melanocytic intraepithelial neoplasia, or CMIN. Approximately three quarters of all conjunctival melanomas arise from PAM. Uh, clinically, they uh, often appear as patchy unilateral pigmentation of the conjunctiva, most uh, often in middle-aged or elderly Caucasian individuals. Uh, other forms of benign melanosis tend to be bilateral and congenital, while PAM is uh, unilateral and acquired at older ages. Uh, PAM without atypia is benign and indistinguishable uh, histopathologically from constitutional melanosis, while PAM with mild to moderate atypia has atypical mel uh, melanocytes that are largely confined uh, to the basal part of the epithelium. PAM with severe uh, atypia uh, usually shows a thickened conjunctival epithelium that's almost completely replaced by nests of atypical uh, pigmented melanocytes. Uh, this is uh, usually compatible with melanoma in situ. Uh, pagetoid spread and epithelioid morphology uh, are typically strong indicators of aggressive disease. Conjunctival melanomas are relatively uh, rare, fortunately, uh, though the incidence is uh, thought to be increasing. It's about one tenth as common. Uh, as uveal melanomas. A conjunctival melanoma also has a better prognosis compared to uveal melanoma of the ciliary body or choroid. Um, and as I mentioned, most of these cases arise from PAM with atypia. These, these cases tend to have the best outcome, whereas de novo melanomas of uh, the conjunctiva tend to have worse prognosis. Uh, clinical factors associated with good outcomes include small tumors, uh, such as uh, less than two millimeters in thickness and a location in the bulbar conjunctiva near the limbus. Uh, 
uh, METs are relatively common to local lymph nodes, such as preauricular intracarotid nodes. And about 40% of cases will have a BRAF V600E mutation. Interestingly, uveal melanomas uh, lack this uh, BRAF mutation, instead have activating mutations in the gene editor. That brings us uh, to uh, um, the end of the presentation. I'll leave you all with uh, two key concepts that I uh, use in my approach to the anterior eye. Uh, the first is to try and maintain a stepwise workup and keep in mind the familiarity with uh, some of these common disease processes I've mentioned. Many of these specimens can be admittedly quite small. Um, so having a highly organized approach often serves me well, especially in these really uh, challenging cases. A uh, second point is that uh, correlating histopathologic findings with the clinical eye exam findings and history are major components to reaching an accurate uh, final diagnosis in my experience. I always try and take a few minutes to review the electronic medical record for these patients to find uh, pertinent clinical uh, notes, uh, which often informs my review of the ocular specimen. And finally, um, I encourage you uh, to reach out to your ophthalmology colleagues. Um, I strongly believe that crosstalk and exchange between the two departments, ophthalmology and pathology, is essential in these cases, and not only in regard to good patient care, but also um, uh, for opportunities for better education and collaborative research. Uh, these are the references that I've used. And this is an image of uh, Brown University campus, and I've included my email at the bottom here in case there are questions uh, or you'd like to uh, reach out to me, uh, please, feel free, free, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ponsoni. This was a, a great talk uh, in which you have detailed the different pathologies of the anterior eye. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Ponsoni, there are a few questions online. Uh, if you don't mind, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Thank you. So the question is from one of our viewers is, in the teresium, can I find a scar uh, which can be highlighted with a meson, meson stain? I mean, uh, meson trichrome, I guess. Yes. Um, sometimes in those cases, um, since they tend to be chronically, uh, uh, you tend to see them in chronic disease cases. Fibrosis can be relatively common. It can be picked up on h &E, but yes, if you're unsure, a trichrome can be helpful in those scenarios. Um, so yes, I, I often will get, I, I guess I mentioned the PAS a few times. PAS is a very quick and easy stain. I use it very commonly, these corneal specimens, um, but trichrome is another good, a simple stain that most labs can do and can be very helpful. There is another question that is there any role of immunohistochemistry in anterior eye diseases? Um, well, I mean, it, it just totally depends on the setting. I, I would say, you know, for most of the cases that I mentioned, um, h &E, simple stains, PS, trichrome, clinical history, you know, serologies, labs, um, cultures, um, microorganism stains, those, those are the primary things that I, that I use uh, in my workup. Uh, immunostains, um, really more for, um, I mentioned with conjunctiva and some of those dysplasias and um, uh, carcinomas, there is some literature about using uh, P53, KI67 to help elucidate whether there's um, any transformation, but uh, the literature is a bit mixed on how, how effective that is. Um, but as I said, there is some literature to it, so it, it can be worth a try in some scenarios. Thank you. Uh there is, uh, the next question is about uh, CIN. So the question is like, are there future plans to change uh, CIN three tier system to ACL and LCL? Uh, I'm not uh, privy to those plans, um, but I will say that, uh, yes, there's a lot of ongoing discussion in terms of how to um, best organize the system. You know, there, there were different um, strategies early on about how to classify it. And there was a five-tiered system and then became a three-tiered system. And with the different systems, um, sometimes it can be a little difficult, I think, or there can be a mismatch between how pathology signs out the report and how ophthalmology interprets it. And so sometimes you have to put in multiple classification schemes in your report just to make it clear. I often find a phone call is a good way to uh, sort it out and just make sure it's understood well. In terms of will the scheme change again to you know, low grades and high grades, that, that's very possible, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Thank you. 
Thank you. So there is another question. I think uh, this might be interesting that uh, the question is that we get uh, not too many specimens of uh, for eye pathology and then experience is limited. So what, do you have any suggestions about what is the correct way to embed specimens? Because maybe like, you know, the specimen is not embedded properly. And another uh, additional question to that is that do you have any example when the specimen was not correct embedded properly? And if that happens, how do you uh, get around it? Any so this, this, is, Thank yeah, you. this is a really important topic. I didn't talk a lot. That, that, this topic is in a, a different one of my lectures. As I mentioned to you before we started, I have a series of these lectures that I do. And one part of a uh, different lecture is on embedding, proper surgical orientation. This, this is a very big topic and it can be quite critical um, in working up these cases. So I, I totally understand a lot of labs don't have familiarity with um, embedding and working up these specimens. Uh, the best thing to do is really to be hands-on. And if you uh, think or you know that you're going to be receiving a corneal specimen, conjunctiva, and nucleation, to actually physically go to the lab and work with the technicians who are going to embed it to try to ensure it's appropriately embedded. Um, if, if it's already been embedded and you know you get it on the slide and you know it hasn't been properly oriented, um, the only thing you can do is melt the block and uh, try to reorient it manually and then go through the process again. So that's why I always advise, and I, I for all I, I do all enucleations personally myself. I'll I'll go and make sure it's done. I'll cut it um, with our residents and fellows, um, and that really helps with the education too. And and to the point that we brought up earlier. Yes, most people may not uh, have uh, ocular pathology at their institution. However, in the community, there may be ophthalmologists who want to send specimens, so it could be a, a way to increase the outreach um, for your institution. And some general surgical pathologists may want to you know, increase the exposure. So it may be something worthwhile looking into about how to properly orient these specimens, how to embed them so you can start working on it as a clinical practice. Thank you for your input, Dr. Pinsoni. I think. Uh... It's a great point uh, that you have mentioned. We would be more than happy to have a session with you on grossing of different, I mean, you know, eye specimens. I think that would be very helpful to our, our viewers across the world. Uh, regarding staying with specimens, there is another question. Uh, what are the common or the most common specimens that you usually receive or the different types of specimens that you receive uh, in your lab? Yeah, good question. So the most common types, I've, I've shown many of them, you know, pterygium. Um, so uh, corneal specimens, conjunctival specimens, eyelid specimens, um, and then uh, decimates, strip, strips that I showed, the decimate strips, usually for Fuchs or uh, other abnormal uh, endothelial dystrophies, and enucleations. So with um, conjunctiva and cornea decimates, they're usually really tiny biopsies. Um, and usually, you know, we, we can work those up ourselves. With the eyelid specimens, those are usually skins. And so I find most helpful, actually, if I'm not comfortable with it, I go see my derm path colleagues, and usually it's something similar. That, that's one other good thing about eye. Eye has some similar areas to other surgical pathology. There's overlap, and so eyelid is similar to, you know, it basically is skin modified epidermis, so you can show it to your derm path colleagues. And then enucleations, yes, we do receive uh, several of those as well. Um, and, and for those, there's a little bit more um, sometimes workup involved. But again, I, I would say the most critical thing really is checking the clinical history, speaking to the ophthalmologist. You, you would be amazed at how much um, in-depth knowledge they can provide. And they can really start you out uh, ahead of the game with what is expected based on what they saw clinically. It can, it can really help a lot. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pansoni. So this is another question that uh, I think cataract surgery is very common like uh, across the world. And uh, usually there is intraocular lens transplant, like, you know, that which is implanted. So what are the common uh, IOL implant related pathologies? Can you, can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, so, you know, the pet, they're very, very common. And so the... The surgery is more refined now, so I think we probably see a little bit less in terms of um, you know uh, secondary types of problems related directly to the surgery. But since they're so common, we, we still get the specimens related to um, you know injuries or uh, resulting pathology. So most commonly, um, we see sometimes with uh, corneal damage, uh, you'll see some of those bullous keratopathies. Um, uh, you'll see some uh, posterior corneal damage with loss of endothelium. 
uh, stromal edema, uh, those bullous changes I mentioned, hydropic epithelial changes, fibrosis. Um, even in one example I showed that was a keratitis, there was that foreign material, that suture. You can see suture material, um, sometimes histiocytic change in the posterior stroma. So, so there, there is a variety of changes you can see. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, patients do well and the surgery is performed well, and there are no um, further pathologies, but Yes, corneal pathology secondary to IOL transplantation uh, does happen. Right, the, the, I, uh, the, the cataract surgery has also improved quite a lot nowadays. Like that uh, you have SICS, I think, which is replaced by FACO now, isn't it? So like, uh, is there any message to the ocular surgeons that there are a few things to keep in mind, like, you know, I mean, from your experience in pathology that, that can be maybe like, you know, paid attention to? Sure. Well, I mean, they're the experts in their area, so I don't know what advice I can give them. Uh, but I would say, I've said several times now, for pathologists to contact and keep in touch with their clinical colleagues, I would urge uh, ophthalmologists and all you know clinical surgeons to keep in touch with their pathology colleagues. If there is a question or if they have a suspicion of something, please don't leave it to the nurse to write something on the requisition. Those messages never get across. And I've had this again in other lectures that I do related to some uh, tumors that we uh, look at in the eye, where it's very, very important to have clinical information in order to process the tissue appropriately, and that message gets lost. So the only advice I can give, it's not a technical advice, I would just please encourage our uh, clinical colleagues, ophthalmologists, to please get in touch with us early. If you have a, a recommendation or a request for how we process the tissue, if there's a piece of clinical history that we should be aware of in working up the tissue, please please reach out to us. Don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to talk to our colleagues. I think that's a great suggestion. So maybe like, you know, in, if the ophthalmologist also or the surgeon comes and then orient together with, uh, yeah. with, with the pathologist or the resident or the pathology assistant who is grossing. So that will make sure that, you know, the specimen is always embedded properly, I mean, to start with, right? It usually prevents a big headache uh, yeah. for us working it up and for our colleagues when we have to call them and say, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't orient it or we couldn't figure it out. If you just do that simple step first, and, and it really provides this good interdepartmental sort of arrangement and for education, as I said, a lot of uh, the clinical colleagues, they're very interested um, in um, supporting that. So I wouldn't hesitate. I'd encourage you all to reach out to your um, um, colleagues. All right. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Punsoni. Uh, you talked about herpes simplex uh, infections. Uh, is there uh, any way that uh, the herpes just sir, though it involves the nerve, so does it involve the anterior compartment in some way if it uh, goes all the way? So any, any, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, primarily, you know, it, 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 it can be, it's very chronic, so you can see a lot of different progressive pathology. Uh, primarily, it affects that, you know, the, the, the cornea and the stroma, and you see that compensatory hyperplasia, and you can see the inflammation chronically. Uh, but yes, most forms of keratitis can progress, and you can see a worsening disease if it's, if it's not treated, and, you know, it, it could progress to, uh, you know, different types of endophthalmitis and, and move to some of the more posterior structures if it's not, if it's untreated. So like you said, herpes zoster can cause keratitis as well, is it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is one question here that, yeah, you discussed about corneal transplant, and I think that might be a big topic by itself, but there is one question about, and, and you talked about transplant rejection versus graft failure. Is that correct? Right. And uh, maybe the qu one question is about uh, who are eligible as donors in corneal transplant? Did you say who are ineligible? Who are the eligible patients? Like, you know, who are eligible to, or like, you know, from whom you can take, like, you know, I mean, what are the criteria to take corneal, you know, transplant? You know, you know that's, that's, that's a fantastic question. That's not really my area in terms of who's eligible and who's not. I'm sure there's a whole scheme. Typically, uh, grafts usually can't have prior pathology, but I don't know the extent of what prior. Usually there can't be any manipulation, prior intracular procedures, chronic, uh, sort of diseases that might recur uh, in the um, the person who's receiving the transplant, but in terms of what those criteria are, I, I can't speak to that. Okay, yeah, and uh, I think there was a follow-up question on that, that uh, how do you differentiate between graft failure versus rejection in corneal transplant? Maybe you mentioned that, but still, if you want to take it. 
Well, uh, graft failure is usually due to some uh, inherent uh, disorder of the uh, endothelium. And so usually you would look and try to identify if there's some uh, obvious abnormality in those areas, whereas uh, rejection usually is more of an inflammatory mediated a process where there's usually has to be some type of neovascularization to allow those uh, immune agents into the cornea. Thank you. I think uh, these are the questions that I found online uh, for you, Dr. Ponsoni. And once again, thanks so much for this uh, wonderful session. And uh, as we discussed, and as you mentioned, that we would be more than happy to, you know, host you for research lectures. And I think this will be very useful because we do not discuss much about eye pathology. And I think this is something uh, that can be really very useful to our colleague. And you would be happy to know that we had a, a lot of viewers who joined online today, joined far away from uh, as far as Bolivia, Philippines, uh, someone joined from UK. Uh, let me see uh, where else we had viewers from, uh, from Turkey. Then, uh, yeah, thanks to our viewers for uh, joining us. And if you like our lectures, don't forget to uh, follow us on YouTube or subscribe our YouTube channel that is Patcast. And we also have a Facebook page uh, you can follow uh, that is Patcast. And we have started an Instagram channel as well. So with the same name, Patcast 2016. So please follow so that you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures. And our next lecture is a liver pathology lecture. We will uh, that is on July 13th, and uh, our speaker will be Dr. Maria Isabel Field, who is a renowned liver pathologist at Mount Sinai in New York, and she's going to talk about grab versus host disease involving liver, so this is an important topic. So I hope to see you all at that time, and thank you again, and thank you, Dr. Ponsoni, for this wonderful talk. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a fantastic platform. Thank you for having me today. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.